guys i'm sean the hustle no bless the flow and today guys we've got a treat for you guys we've got our first guest on which we're really excited about and um les is actually going to introduce him for us yeah so our first guest today uh a dear brother of mine uh steve steve brophy is a father of two and a husband uh he's also an educator an innovator and peak performance expert uh he has over 15 years of experience in uh education currently the director of technology and e-learning at a grammar school in victoria australia he is also the director of thrive capacity a peak performance coaching service helping individuals and organizations find and operate through optimal states of flow and he's worked through with uh such groups as the flow genome project flow center uh blue chip minds independent schools of victoria and much more he is also the director of design and play a digital education consultancy as well as a co-host of a podcast in the same name which is all, which is all about education tech innovation pedagogy design and creativity uh <laughs> lastly he is also a conference host uh, at teach tech play professional learning community designed by teachers for teachers so welcome brother oh it's so good to be the first <laughs> guest man and so like i'm listening to that bio just going oh there's um it's lovely hearing it come from your words man thank you it's, it's an honor to be a guest hey thanks for thanks for being here mate and uh yeah we we look forward to the conversation yeah so i'm really excited to have you on steve and um you know les shared um your history with me earlier and i guess your progression through what you've chosen to dedicate your life to and it's um first is very impressive so hats off to you thanks man and um really interested to to hear from someone who actually teaches teachers and educates educators as part of what you do i think it's um such an interesting field to be in yeah well considering the the times we're in it's it's really interesting because i would say that we're in I've said to a lot of the staff that I work with we're in the biggest shift in education since the industrial revolution. So this is okay. requiring adults to shift and change, it's requiring kids to shift and change, it's requiring teachers to adjust practice, it's requiring all of these elements and so currently um education is a real hot topic because how do we navigate complexity? Well, it's through education, it's through change, it's all through all of those elements, and so it's um, it's been a passion of mine since since day dot. Like I've always been curious and always been a been a seeker of truth and and somebody who's reached out and, and tried to figure out what how the world works. And being the eldest of four meant that I had a, a mentor role always by default, even if I didn't want it. I had that yeah. kind of teacher role, and so. I, I fell into it. I fell into education. I really sort of stumbled when I got to the end of year 12 and I chose, I guess, a combination of two things that I loved, which was human movement. So I became a PE teacher and that combination of, of moving, knowing your body, being physically active and being a mentor to people led me to now be an educator for, for um, in my 21st year. So it's... Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's ever evolving. And so education is life. And that's mm. like Leslie and I have connected over education and being on a on a path of of inner but like an inner education where we're really questioning, looking at the self, looking at I guess the evolution of, of who we are, the masks we wear, all of that stuff. So yeah, it's it's a field that I'm deeply passionate about. Um and it's also a field that everybody has a say on yeah. because we've all been educated and that's that's where it gets really really interesting so that's what that's what i'm hoping to to riff on today with you guys is to kind of pull from your own experience and just see what pops up yeah totally sounds awesome bro and um i guess outside of uh education and uh and in the professional context uh lucky to tell 
uh, our audience a little bit more about yourself and I guess even, um, you know, uh, how we met uh, and anything else you want to, you know, tell people about. Yeah, cool. So I have always been somebody who's loved the challenge of rising to, to, you know, to the performance. So whether it was playing sport, music, whatever it was, but then I'd often find myself getting in my own way. So the self doubt, imposter syndrome, sort of all of those elements, you could have one day where your performance would be like, this is me at my peak. And then the next day it's like, wow, that's just me as a fraud. And so I was always deeply passionate about how, how is there such a disparity between the good and, and the bad? And that led me on a journey really like it through education. So I did my master's and um, I remember reading about this, this word flow and mm. talking, it was talking about Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the Hungarian psychologist who coined the phrase. And I'm like, man, oh, this is this, this word flow. It's that's when I'm at my best that shows up. It just feels effortless. It just feels like it's just moving through me. It's almost like, if I'm speaking the words, uh, then I'm not even in control and it's just moving through me. And so that led through a really deep inquiry to learn more about flow and that it, it started as a performance thing. Like I want to be optimized. I want to be better. It was really, it started in the me trying to, I guess, fine tune my own performances, mm -hmm. but it ended up being a deeper I guess, journey. And that's when I discovered the, the concept of Wu Wei, you know, the Eastern philosophy that life is flow. And so when I started to delve into that, that's when our paths crossed, Les, and, and we met through a good brother of ours, Jiro Taylor, and his work with the Flow State Collective. Mm. And what was the searching for better, for striving for performance, ended up being more a journey around contentment around stillness around the inner work and the counterbalance to that and the really funny thing then is that led to me doing a lot of work with the flow genome project which is a, an organization that does i guess their their three tiers are ecstasis so looking at the, the peak performances the altered state of consciousness they look at catharsis sort of healing and then communitas, which is which is community. And so I've done work with them, done their coaching certification, and then really felt a calling to work with other people to, to spread that work and to share that work. And it's not all about the crest of the wave. It's actually about the healing and, and doing the inner work, the being able, the capacity to be still. And then when you feel that you're ready to stand up and you feel that you're in a place where you're, you're stable, it's then about reaching out to the next level to spreading the word amongst family, then amongst community. And so my business happened like my, my calling into education happened by accident. Mm. I just felt the calling to do this. And then with the rise in, in companies with burnout, with the need for productivity, remote learning, like all of these elements, people, that was the Trojan horse to work with people to go, do you want to perform better? Do you want to feel better? Like no company worth their salt does not want those things for their, for their employees. I want more product productivity. I want them to feel good about it and for them to be able to be creative and have tremendous insight. Like that's just the no brainers, but really the work is inner work and the work is about the capacity to, to be, to be still. And that's led to my company Thrive Capacity. And, and what I love about those two words is I love the word thrive because nature thrives. It doesn't need our, our input. Mm. And then it has the capacity. And what I love about capacity is it's just this endless. So it's infinite. It's, you think about potential and it's the same sort of thing. So, totally. yeah. So I've been doing that for probably four years now. And yeah, I'm loving it. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for the intro, man. Uh, and a good little segue to uh, our topic for, for this week's podcast. Um, you may or may not know, Sean and I, uh, whenever we pod, we, we just bring up a random topic and we just riff on it um, candidly. So what better topic to bring up and talk about today than education? Um, 
So maybe I'll throw to you, Shauna. Um, when we say education, what do you think about? What are your thoughts on it? Um, I think so. Education for me, regardless of who you are and what you do, no matter what age you are, is always about improvement. Right? It's about learning and improvement. And and I heard you say that word a few times, Steve, which was improvement. Um, and to me, that's what education really is. Um, so. Um, you also mentioned something really interesting that I think might throw us on a bit of a tangent, but I want to throw it out there while I still remember. And it's, um, you said when it comes to working with companies, there was this need or rather people talk about burnout and productivity and all these things. And you use that as a Trojan horse mm -hmm. to um, get into those organizations. Right. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because, um, you know, I think the three of us here on this um, podcast at the moment, we are very much into doing the inner work um, so that we're no stranger to that. But for people that aren't, I think it's something that, you know, a lot of, a lot of time sounds hokey. People are wondering, um, you know, what it actually involves. And um, but what I'm interested in, in the hearing about from you, Steve, is how you actually bring people from that sort of mentality of what's this all about, or even being apprehensive towards it, which a lot of people are right when they start out um to actually guiding them down this path i think that's such an interesting um interesting journey and i'd love to hear from you about it and how that how that typically goes down yeah look it's really the i like the word trojan horse because people seek certain things so if you you're a company and you're working with a learning development part of the company or with with human resources they'll have measurables. And so what you, what they're looking and seeking is to quantify that we can improve productivity, quantify that we can improve well. So they're the elements where that's what they're seeking. And so you go in there and you give them that. Absolutely, you give them that because flow does, you know, improve all of those areas. But what happens, and this is the part where that's just, that can be just content, you know, transaction like here is good information you can take what you want apply it but where it really comes into play is through dialogue and so the process of emergence so the process of coaching you start to unravel and get to the, the core of things which is they're in a narrative what's in the way and, and and so with the work that i do i base it on a real strong basis of learning development theory so Robert Keegan's work out of Harvard, looking at how adults develop, but also then creating experiences and, and designing experiences where people have got to put rubber on the road. So instead of talking about it, which is we're all good of really what happens when you are in the throes of it. So when you're under the pump, when you've got stress levels, how do you deal with it when you're in that situation and that application the doing part, that's where the real, the real work is. Because when you reach a nine and 10 on your stress levels, you are in fight or flight. You are literally, you are biologically primitive. And so the work that we do is actually being able to notice that and even doing some training on the outside in preparation for that. So things like breathing, breath work, so box breathing, and really creating micro stress on the outside the same way you would go to the gym and do the same thing like you're literally breaking your body down but in preparation for, for good performance so you you create experiences where people have it's i guess a container for uh, a miniature version of that experience and through daily practices through continued short feedback loops they develop some strength so with breath, you know, you, I take the box breathing example. You may start and do five, box breathing is just in for a count of five, hold for a count of five, out for a count of five, and, and then hold again. And what it's designed to do is over time, you can increase the duration of that. And it's create, you get that sort of gag reflex where you really want to breathe, but it's teaching your body to become comfortable with the physiological, physiological reaction you have when you get stressed and noticing it because it's innate, you can't control it. But if you have the ability to down-regulate and come back to breath and center yourself, then maybe you're not a nine and 10 on the stress level scale, maybe you're a seven or an eight. And when you can move down a little bit, all of a sudden then you have a few more things at your disposal. 
So I give lots of scientific frameworks to organizations because once again, it's evidence-based. Uh, we all lend, lend and lean on that. But I also bake in a lot of philosophy into it. So where I come from, like I really resonate with Eastern philosophy, you know, Zen, Buddhism, Taoism. And, but if I, you were to go into organizations that way, they would be you no know, red flag. So productivity, the Trojan horse, that's the way in. And it's like, here's what we think we need, but you give them what, what, what they truly need. Um, and so good education frameworks, really rigorous science, create the experience and do it. So I've, I've got an activity that I do as a, a stable in, in my kind of workshops. And I guarantee you, I've done this in boardrooms with, with you know, boards of directors, I've done it with whole organizations, I've done it with teachers, with students, and there is people laughing, smiling, like the human element just lights up in the room. And it, it's guaranteed because we have these innate biological drives. And when we get out of the head of constantly doing and come back to a little bit of play, a little bit of flow, fun, all of a sudden we start to remember that we're humans and that life is pretty damn awesome. It's really cool and very interesting. I mean, um, and we've talked, uh, we've spoken about this before, Steve, uh, and um, it's really, really nice practical example and approach in terms of understanding the lay of the land in terms of that particular corporate environment and um, that rigidity and that uh, stout uh, numbers based approach and view of the world, you know, very in and out, black and white. Um, and then slowly melding in these, these beautiful harmonic pieces of Eastern flowy philosophy uh, that, that beautifully, uh, you know, harmonize and uh, accompany each other in a, in a really, really nice way. Um, you've seen these types of uh, elements or philosophies throughout history, um, you know, from matching Zen with uh, Western psychotherapy and things like that. And um, I think it's a really good example for current days. Uh, I've experienced the same uh, sort of challenges, if you want to put it, uh, back in my corporate days uh, as a meditation guide and teacher, offering that to a very stoutly corporate big wig uh big four bank sort of environment and you do get a lot of uh scoffing and um you know dismissive sort of gestures and things like that because it, it does seem a little bit woo woo and up out there but um then you get once people actually sit with those types of you know uh, practices then th there's, there's a there's an innate feeling of uh of rest and peace that 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 comes up and they sort of start to understand but it is it is a tough sort of balancing act to to play i think yeah yeah and to come back to your question sean and then to link yours les like you're in the organization and and i guess one of the the challenges for me as an educator is we we educate for a score so you can get an into, into university and we can get like, you can move on a path and there's like a recipe for success. So in your experience, if you think about the schooling that we've all shared, it's all very similar. Like you go into a classroom these days and nothing much really has shifted. So why, why do you believe we scoff at that which we do not understand and especially in something like a corporate environment or or an environment that's a really high intensity it can be in startup it can be whatever it is why do you why do you believe based on let's look at it from the learning framework we get there like people like oh it's like the container of oh it's woo woo mm -hmm. it's almost like a i could put it in that container and then no matter how, what you say and do because I've labeled it woo woo, you can't undo that label. So I guess I'm really keen to know your experience of living in it, um, looking at it from an education point of view, why people are so rigid in their thinking, why people are so, I guess, seeking black and white versus the color of say philosophy and so forth. Well, I think that it's, it comes down to the level of priming 
and uh, pre prepositioning that uh, we have mostly received in uh, the Western world, modern Western world. And a, a lot of it is about since the, you know, um, the Enlightenment period uh, in the 1700s, 1800s, it's, it's this emergence or shift from, you know, the mystic theology into scientific, you know, discovery. And those sorts of things that start to solidify what we feel we thought we knew or hypothesized into concrete fact. And that has rolled on in the Western world until today. And I think that sort of has become this unstoppable freight train almost. It, it was like the, the rise of that was, was immense. Um, and it created this dualistic view of life. You know, it's either right or wrong. If it's not right, then it must be wrong. If it's not real, it must be fake. Uh, and if we don't know what it is, and if science haven't told us what it is, then it mustn't be factual, or it must not uh, work in the way that it has been philosophized to work, or whatever it is. So I think, especially in the corporate environments, I think those are the, the models of you know Western view of you know black and white efficiency, productivity. It's all driven off numbers and quantifiable data. Um, it's only recent times that uh, those more qualitative factors have been brought into play to start to, you know, uh, balance that out a little bit. Though I, I, that, that's the feeling I get of being in that environment heavily for over a decade. Yeah. So. How about you, what about Sean? you, Sean? Yeah. Um, I think people often shy away from like they label things woo woo and put them in that box and put them away because a lot of times people have seen people delve down those paths and it looks hard. And I just have this inherent belief that so many people just avoid what is hard. I think there's this, um, this notion around doing inner work or, you know, approaching things from a philosoph philosophical, um, framework that looks like it's going to take a lot of time, that it's going to take a lot of effort and you might know, not know what to do and you're going to have to go and, you know, seek coaching or you're going to have to read a lot or you're going to have to do research and you're going to have to actively learn. And a lot of people view that as a challenge and one that they might not willing or be willing to put the effort into. And I think that's a big part of it for a lot of people. They're like, oh, first they may not see it as fact because of their priming as, as Les mentioned. I think that's definitely an element for sure. It's like where your mindset is um, when those concepts are brought to you, right? People react instead of respond a lot of times and they'll hear something and be like, oh, it's not, you know, that's not how it is or oh, no, it's bullshit. So they just, they might dismiss it in that moment. But then if they actually um, don't have that response and think about it and be like, oh, well, if I go down this path, what does that involve? And it doesn't have to be a lengthy thought process for them so much as it could just be, oh, shit, that looks really hard. I don't think I want to do that. Yeah, I think that's a part of it for sure. Yeah, and it's really interesting because the, the question that keeps popping into my head, and I, and I really, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of thinking on this. So obviously there's a lot of disruption going on. So I, like, I, I think that we will have a massive shift in how we deliver schooling. But the mm. word education is different. And I think that how we learn versus that dualism of right and wrong is really, really different. Because for example, like I'm teaching my son how to read and he's very much, you know, I don't know how to do it. It's very black, it's very white. But if you look at the pictures, and you infer meaning, you can make sense of the narrative and you've got your own memories, you've got your own experiences. So that in combination with your interpretation of the picture creates a story and, and that's how you make meaning from reading and that's how you begin to do it. But I guess now if you were to, knowing what you know now, if you were to, to start school again, throw it all out, and I've been really riffing on this, what are the key things you would bring in, like core components? What, what, what would, at the, I guess, the, the point that we're in our lives, what is it 
that you believe you wish you were taught at school? And what would be the core components? Just a small question. <laughs> uh, I, I was just thinking about this when you were speaking and talking about this, this sort of um, this precipice that we're in with, re with regards to education and what it was and what it could be or where it's, where it's going down. And I just reflect back on my own uh, education experience and it will answer your question to some degree, I think. Um, I didn't like it because I was being forced down a certain road into a box where everything uh, was dictated to me and I had to do everything a certain way and if I didn't do it that way then it was incorrect it was wrong and I got punished for it right um, I wasn't able to be expressive um, which which is the key here so now when I think about my own experience and education, I really feel like it only just started or it ever only existed outside of uh, formal schooling and, and university and things like that. It only ever existed for me in those contexts because all the things that uh, was taught to me in, in a schooling context, I just didn't want to actually learn. I had no desire to learn it. And, and, and possibly also in the manner that I was being taught. Um, my education has been through reading. Uh, in the last seven or eight years, it's just been all about self-education, learning, reading, uh, following these breadcrumbs that each book sort of just leaves for me. I'm just like, okay, follow this, th those little trails, speaking to people who, um, and learning from people who have similar philosophies or takes on life and learning from people's experience. Like you said, you know, getting the rubber to the road, that actual experience of learning, learning through experience, learning to, uh, I guess, how would you call it? Um, a proactive approach, a, a proactive approach that comes from the heart, you know, it's led from the heart and nothing else. And from there, I guess it, it has allowed a true flourishing of uh, authentic expression, which I think that in itself is something that was missing when I was in school. Yeah. It's really interesting because I would say that you're one of the most creative people that I know in, in terms of expression. And it's interesting, there's a few threads in there, so voice, so having the ability to express voice, mm. the, then the choice like the, and the drive that you have from a, from a motivation point of view. So when you're intrinsically, if you think of it like a, like a journey, you're motivated to move to the next step. You're not sure where you're going and you'll seek counsel from the wisdom of books, the wisdom of people. You'll walk a few paths, fail, you fall over, you'll create art, you'll express. Um, so it's really, really interesting that we've got this, this typical journey and then we have this beautiful expression and there's a lot more choice in it and you drive and there's a lot of research being done at the moment. There's a, it's a really good paper from the All Australian Learning Lecture. It's called Beyond the ATAR and in it, they talk about the pathway myth. So the fact that we say that this is a pathway to a successful career, this is a pathway to happiness, all of these elements is actual bullshit. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of times the university, their business model has shifted and changed. So my wife started studying. All she had to do was pay the money, pass the first two subjects, boom, you're in. And so we've got this pathway myth that's not quite correct. And then when you get into the corporate world, when you get into business, uh, you, if you haven't got those, that voice, that expression, that choice, well, I would say that that would increase burnout, that would have stress, that would lead to you feeling unhappy at work. Totally. Yeah. yeah. What about your experience, Sean? I'm keen to know what, what, what would you do differently knowing what you know now? Um, well, it's actually really funny. I don't know. I can't remember how it came up yesterday, but I was talking to my partner about it and I just talked about how I hated school. I hated it. Yep. I did really well at school by 
or measures of what you would like. I did really well academically. I was a prefect or I was like school captain in my public school. And then I was a prefect all the way through high school. And I had, you know, I had really good friends and stuff. Also had some not so great experiences, which, you know, everybody does at, um, in high school, like bullying and people being mean. And then you trying to figure yourself out through that, you know? Um, but by all measures, you know, from the outside in, you'd say I had a good experience in school, but I hated it. Like I always just felt, and I, it's weird ever since like primary school, since I was a little kid, I just always thought to myself, life gets way better after this. Like always, man. Like since I can remember, I was just always thought to myself, man, life gets better after this. Just finish this and then you're going to be able to do what you want. And that's what my experience of school, when I think about it is, it was something that was just dictated to me. I was told that I had to do things in a certain way. Um, and I just figured out early on, I was like, cool, man, what's the system? What do I have to do? What's the result that everybody wants me to get? How do I get it? And then I just did that because I thought once I finish, I'm going to be able to do what I actually want to do. Right. Yeah. Wow. So that, that was my, like in hindsight, that's my experience of it. Like I studied very hard, but what I think back on now is no one told me how to study and no one really taught me how to learn or showed me what the best way to learn would be. It was just, you take notes or watch this thing. And because when we were in school, like YouTube wasn't a thing, mm. you know, mobile phones had just come in. Um, so uh, learning was still very much like hand out these notes. We had the internet, but it wasn't as prolific as it is today, you know? So doing assignments and stuff like that was still, you had to get books and all that sort of stuff. But what I felt would have been great is if someone actually took the time to figure out, not just for me, but for any, any child, because that's what you are at that time of your life is, um, how does this person best take on information? How do they learn? Like what's the best way? And, and I know it's very difficult when, you know, you've got hundreds of or thousands of kids in, in the one place and you're trying to teach them all at the same time, but individualistic learning, I think is where it's at to me personally, it's, it's figuring out how people learn and um, how they best respond to things and then working out ways to present um, information to them that in a way that they will learn. Yeah, it's really interesting. The you the illusion of success. So you basically game mm. the system. So all right. So what oh, what do you need me to do? And then I'll just game it. And and it's often and, and and there's a thread of it. So the challenge is we often endure schooling, but education yes. is is holistic. Like education is beautiful. When you unravel learning for people, it's still the same beauty within it. But so often we're kind of going through this rite of passage of school. And this is not dissing teachers because, hmm. <clears throat> because teachers are spectacular. They get to, they just are working within the system. This is the system that we're working within. But I guess now for me, the, what I'm looking at is it, when the system is disrupted, like in all innovation, these are the opportunities for innovation this is where the adjacent possible this is where that shadow future is there and so looking at our experiences when we talk about schooling it comes tainted with narrative everybody yeah. has an experience and that's when it becomes so like this is almost like schooling is in the woo woo bucket because <laughs> i can either game it or i hated it or i just was in the middle and i had good days and bad days and i think totally when I think of education and I think of my own kids, I think about, all right, what is it that I want as a parent from the education system? Well, I want my kids to be seen. And that comes back to your point about who am I being individual people, knowing you having rapport, having a real network and a community, and then the ability to, to have choice within that, to explore with depth, the yes. things that drive you that you're passionate about, but also to then expose you to new elements. And so a kind of a Renaissance type of education where I love this thing, but I'm introduced to all of these things and that infuses this one thing maybe that I'm, that I'm deeply passionate about. And I think I'd also want for my kids to develop 
the ability to make sense of the world. And I'm a big believer in sense making tools. So whether it's mental models to look at the world, you know, the scientific method is a mental model. It's to understand and design for bias. It's to look at the world and make sense of it and understand that when you take information in that you're being selective. So our reticular activation system is actually selecting information that you're choosing. And if you aren't aware of that, then you can have biases and you can have blind spots in, in education. So I would want some to develop real sense making skills. Then I'm going to go really out there. And this one, brother Leslie, you'll know this one. I would have loved to have been taught how to build fires, uh, do knots, do all of yes. the stuff that when we were out on yes, quest dude. that, that <laughs> I was just like, I've got no clue how to do any of this real survival stuff. And mm. it's like, and it's not a oh, survival and the world is ending. It's actually, let's come back to basic human needs. <clears throat> I know how to tend to food and grow it. Mm. I know how to look out, create shelter, <clears throat> do all these things. I'd love to know that stuff. Yes. I, I just never got taught that. Mm. And then be exposed to, to philosophy, to, to design, to create, to express song, dance, move, like all of these beautiful human elements, which now that we're all in isolation, we're all damn missing. How many <laughs> things are you, are you seeing where people are singing, where people are creating expressions, concerts, drumming, like just where you get lost in this real beautiful human things, not content to know, but it, it like, a set of skills that will help you navigate tumultuous times. That for me is what I believe education should be. Schooling is overcrowded. There's so much in there and everybody's fighting for their slice of the pie. But now what would we take out? Because I, I bet you, you have said these words to yourselves. When am I going to use this in my life? Right. And so oh, many man. times, People in school are like, I don't see the relevance of it. And mm. because I'm not in the situation where I need to use it. Yes, totally. Yeah. And, and that's another thing, which like what I wish I had learned um, in school or just in my education, because I went to university as well, right? I did a bachelor's degree in business um, for marketing finance. But all the things I learned in, in that, I never applied to what I did, which was marketing. In, <laughs> like everything I learned in you, I never applied fucking once. <laughs> and I remember distinctly reading in a textbook once it said it was a finance subject. Right. And I opened it was first chapter and it was um, in the real world, you will use a computer for this. However, <laughs> for the purpose of the demonstration, we're going to blah, blah, blah. And I was like, even the book fucking knows I'm not going to use this. <laughs> right? And the book was written by one of the lecturers in the subject. Oh, surprise, surprise, that we all had to buy. So mm. it cost but, you about 150 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, but that's the other thing. I'm like, once we all finished school and I finished uni and, you know, um, I run a business, I didn't learn one actual basic element of running a business that I use. Mm. Right. And things in, I think back further to school. Um, there's things that we all do as adults and humans in the society we live in now, which is we all work in an office at some point, not all of us, but a lot of us do, or we have to work out how to use a bank account, get a mortgage, do our taxes, um, you know, drive cars, all this stuff that we do, right. That there is like no education about, except for maybe one hour, some like healthy Harold comes in and tells you about it. Or <laughs> we all have bodies. Like He's still around, you know, bodies, right? <laughs> healthy Harold was a bet. He's still honestly, around. It's nuts. Cause I'm like, everybody has a body, but you don't learn too much about it. Right. You do kind of like when you do PE later and you learn about physiology and things like that, but it's um, at a very surface level. And what I've noticed now that I'm older as well is that, you know, children and adolescents are actually have a far greater aptitude than we think oh, man, to learn totally. things and to take on concepts and to take on things that we see as mature. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, no, 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 we're not going to expose them to that. I think, yeah, of course there are certain things that, you, you know, uh, 
people shouldn't be exposed to at a certain age and that's proven through science of like you don't have the mental capacity to deal with it or to comprehend mm -hmm. but there, i feel there are a lot of things that we could be exposed to at a younger age that would help us so much more um, later in life and also then practical skills that so many of us have to use now as adults that were never touched yeah. ever ever touched in school totally I want to I want to talk about a few things that have just been spoken about in the last ten minutes or so. I might not be answering any questions at all, but um, I think some some semblance of connectivity is gonna is gonna unravel. I feel. Let, let's see what happens. I'm just gonna fucking riff. All right. <laughs> so, with regards to uh, we we're talking about you know um, individual learning that Sean mentioned and you know the overcrowdedness of the schooling system as it is now and what does that create that creates a, um i guess a detachment from individuality and then people just become numbers right and it's and it's less personal and it's more about this machine of churning volume in and out right to serve whatever purpose education is supposed to serve right now and i i reflect back to I guess I don't have children myself and I don't plan on having children ever but if I did I would be personally a strong proponent and supporter or advocate of homeschooling or self-schooling because I feel that in itself that speaks to this individualistic learning that we're talking about here and you spoke about that through parenthood yourself Steve you know nurturing the individual needs and um, I guess, direction of, of your own child. And you get that one-on-one -on -one attention, right? And you get to direct that in the way that it wants to come out, which is beautiful. And of course, again, overcrowded schooling, there isn't the ability and capacity to do so right now. So it has to be very uh, structured to, to push through the volumes at a, at a baseline, right? What we feel is the right foundation to take these children with through the schooling system and, and send them out the other end. Now, when you talk about, you know, those more practical skills that we that we don't get to learn and the more tactile stuff like going out and building fires and, you know, tying knots and all that sort of stuff that, that, that to me, not necessarily things that uh, are going to be, uh, absolutely useful per se in in modern in the modern world but um the important point i'm trying to make here is that tactile you know that tactile uh, sensory uh, learning you know the practicality of everything right it's to like you were saying that same analogy of getting the your rubber on the road and doing things with your hands right and we think about this this um reflect back in history in uh, tribal settings when there is only the, the immediate family, you know, there is that tactile learning that's very practical because they need to learn whatever they need to learn for survival, right? And they get to flourish as they're supposed to flourish because it's one-on-one. -on -one. And then it started growing into larger, larger tribes that are governed by a, a chieftain. Then it gets a bit more complicated and that's where we start to build these structures in, right? And then it comes to the point where we are today in modernity, where everything is outsourced and uh, everything is so accessible and easy to get out in the world that we don't bother learning anything until it comes to a point where we need to. And I think um, situations like we're in now, we're in, uh, what is it, early April, 2020, so in the midst of self-isolation with this uh, coronavirus pandemic. So a lot of people are sort of freaking out and saying, you know, what am I going to do for food? How am I going to eat? And all that sort of stuff. I usually go out and get my food and even simple things like cooking, you know, people are uh, not equipped with those practical skills. Um, and I don't know what point I was trying to make really, but I wanted to bring those full circle. And I think that the, the theme here is, is not necessarily one extreme or another, it comes back to balance for me. How do you balance these two, you know, these two polarities, this structure in a, in a, in a world that is modern, that is ever expansive, that has billions and billions of people, right? 
through with the with the nurturing of individual flourishing you know that that's the balance that may be missing so yeah yeah and, and to your point there Les, like like one of the learning theories that that i love is called inaction and it basically says that that learning is active you actively construct it in situ so we talk about real world learning i'm like well there's pretend world and the simulations but when you create in situ experience, like mm. when you have to create a company and you have to market, you have, you're in situ, you're like, how do I do this? Fuck, I've got no clue. So you're mm. then struggling. And this is the really interesting element is people think the struggle is you not getting it. Mm. The struggle is needed. Like you go to a gym and you work out, if you're not struggling on those last couple of reps, you aren't breaking your body down that process of catabolism is not happening if you're not struggling like the the generation effect to think like read a passage and then think what was in that passage you aren't strengthening those neural pathways and so in situ learning where we teach people that the struggle is beautiful and the analogy of either going with the grain or against the grain and understanding that if you're forcing, forcing, forcing is like to, to let go and then maybe to pivot and shift, but not see the results as a reflection of I, but hmm, I'm not getting it yet. And then making a pivot. And I think the in situ learning, the other thing is like, I, I would say that I am my kids teacher. Like mm. as a parent, I am the most important teachers in their life. Totally. But there's stuff that teachers do and get my kids to do. I'm like, oh man, how did you do that? And so <laughs> you, you go back to, to the way we used to live in community, which wasn't that long ago. Mm. You had a tribe of, of elders, of brothers, of uncles, of that, you know, aunties and, and cousins. And, and they were your, your network where you could lean and be a different version and they could give you a di- it, it, like that's the component that's that's really I, I believe is missing and so i've yeah. done a lot of teaching in schools where we've had composite classrooms and i'm talking about like prep to grade three mm-hmm. and then grade three to year seven so within that you've got this almost hierarchy of age but it doesn't really mm-hmm. matter because you you adopt a a paternal role you adopt a maternal role you drop the brother like you become this and the kids thrive there because they've got somebody to look to. And then they've also, when it's their turn, they get to play that role. And I think the in situ part, the active construction, it, the, for the work that, that I do with the, that, so like you know, we do a lot of work around entrepreneurship and student entrepreneurship, mm. they're still in the land of pretend. Until you say, this is a real business, that's a real website, real domain, you are solving a real problem, this is the business model canvas, you are, you are working through it the same way entrepreneurs do. And then they're like, oh, I mean, we can really do this. And I think that's that, that, that pivot where you're, when you're in situ, when you're in it, and you've got to just do it, you've got... Like, so I taught myself how to code because I, I, I built a website in situ. I had to learn how to do it. And I think the practical application is what's missing, but because we've got such a, like a depth of curriculum, that's the, the real challenge because the experiential element that the design of it, people are, uh, it's harder to quantify. It's, it's messier. It's, but that's learning. Like you don't go from A through to Z in that beautiful order. You probably go to A to E to D to B. Like you just go back and forth, mistake, throw that one out, start again. That's the, the elements. I think what you were talking about before, Les, that's, that's really, really important. Totally. Where's this learning situated and how much, how, how high is the skill and challenge in this? Like, is it really pressing me and pushing me? And then, we're all in the situation now where survival is becoming a thing. Like, damn, I'm not going to learn how to cook. <laughs> we move beyond baked bake beans and toasts. Yeah. So it, it's, yeah, it's really challenging. Mm. The, the in situ part is so interesting and it just makes you think of you always do better or not do better. You always put in more effort when you've got skin in the game. Hell yeah. And that's what it is to me. It's like skin in the game. Absolutely. And, and you think how about do we it, create that? Yeah. 
and how do we create that as adults? Mm. So, so, so often within organizations, you've got people who've been in similar roles for a long, long time. Like there's, there is the wall of comfort is up and around. And so, so when you move through a process of change, which is just natural evolution, you've got people fighting it and mm. trying to control it. And in, in actual fact, this is just, this is how humans evolve. We, we grow, we evolve, we change and change is just coming. It's like waves. It's just not going to stop because you're, you're done with it. It's in situ. And so I would also say that the, the, the educating kids, educating adults on, on resilience and, and understanding that the human beings are delightfully resilient. We, we have with stood so much and we continue to rise like Phoenix from the ashes and, and that's human. And, um, yeah, it's, it's really, really important. Yeah. And, um, you mentioned, you know, teaching kids and teaching adults. One thing that I'm interested to find out from you, Steve is, is there a marked difference between teaching kids and adults or is there a lot of overlap? Um, kids are, are ballsier. They'll okay. just go for it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I so, don't have kids either. So, yeah. so that's, that's what I'm interested to know. Yeah. Kid, and it's really interesting because it, I've mapped this on lots of experience that, that girls are, and boys have got this like difference and there's a lot of blend and a lot of overlap, but girls are way, the, the girls that I've taught in my experience, but way more methodical and, and slow and deliberate. But when they move, it's like, whoa, that's, that's awesome. Whereas the boys are, like Hulk, smash, bam, 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 bam. And then yeah. they get to the same place. It's just a different pathway and exploration. For, mm. for adults, adults, adults are harder, man, because you know why? It's the unlearning component. 100%. So when, you've, yeah, when you have to unlearn, it is way more difficult. So that's why mm. kids adapt and they've got greater plasticity in their brains yeah. because really the neural pathways aren't set. You're not undoing old habits. So... That's okay. the, the bigger challenge and mindset. Kids are like, you say to a five-year-old, how good are you? I am the greatest drawer that's ever lived. Yeah. 100% truth from the heart, from love. And you know what? They are. But you yeah. go get to a 12-year-old, I'm not as good as, like they, the, the process of comparison, they've already mm -hmm. started to push down the limits about what I can do and can. And then by the time they get out, They've got a particular set of skills, a la Liam Neeson, that they know how to do. <laughs> and then they've also got <laughs> things that they won't touch. Like, I am a shit drawer. I'm like, well, mm. that's bullshit. That's mm. real bullshit. Because I think with the right coaching and with the right mindset and the right dedication to craft and to practice, yeah. you could become a kick-ass drawer. Let's, let's yeah. map out a learning continuum for you and you do the work with short feedback loops and... and um, powerful tutelage you know anybody control that totally 100 yeah. percent, man and i think um you know we've all sort of experienced that uh adult learning or unlearning or mentorship in some capacity uh we've all mentored people uh either you know personally or professionally or whatever um and absolutely man like 100 percent resonate with you and um echo your sentiments about unlearning that that in itself is uh, ninety percent of the work, right? Just chipping away at, at these calcified, false beliefs that have been conditioned over time, and it, it's like that old saying: um, "You can't, what is it? You can't teach an old dog new tricks or whatever." It's because that people are just so set in their ways. Once they uh, grasp on and calcify and believe something with such fervor, and you know. Um, undeniable uh, truth. Um, it, it's hard to even be open-minded to anything outside of that. Um, and I'm sure we've all done this for ourselves to some degree, you know, that that is the work. Um, uh, absolutely. And you, you often then surround yourself with people who say the same things. And so you have an echo chamber <laughs> that further supports your thing. And the internet supports that. Totally. You can find people who believe the same thing, but the true gift and the true power is how am I wrong? Mm -hmm. Like the ability to hold in your, your, your mind two different opposing views and seeing that 
maybe it's not dualism. Maybe it's not right or wrong. Maybe there's emergence between this. If I have the ability to dance between them mm. and that's the power, that's where, where dialogue, that's where like group flow and flow happens when you get a group of people together who come like create containers for psychological safety, create containers where people could speak freely and allow things to emerge like a la improvisation. That's where the beauty is. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I know that conversations that like this one, I'm on cloud nine afterwards because mm. we, we start, we, we, we like you map out a, this is the path that we're going to take in this, this conversation. Nah, like you put <laughs> in, out, it goes all over the place, but it's richer and more beautiful because of it, because we, we each have contributed ingredients to, to the cake that emerged just here. I'm, really? My wife's making cake, hence the cake reference. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to send me some of that, mate. Yeah, dude. I just not get out the front door. My kids are just, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. I mean, that 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 uh, container that you talk about, that's absolutely, you know, um, th that's the concept behind, you know, my own community finding space, you know. It's all about enabling people to be completely authentic and express themselves in a way that they feel like innately they need to express themselves. And I feel like that, that word need is key, right? It's about uh, just uncorking that 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 pressure of suppressing whatever it is that you have inside of you because outside world thinks it's strange or weird or hokey or whatever. Um, just, you know, unadulterated, pure authenticity. And it's beautiful. It, it is truly beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I, I love, like I, I keep the word finding space is just beautiful. And I read something in a, in a book the other day, Effortless Living by Jason Gregory, which is an awesome book. And it was talking about, so take a crucible. So where, like you take a golden crucible, where is the value in the crucible? And the value is not in the shape of the crucible. The value mm -hmm. is in the fact that the crucible creates space or something to go in. And when we protect and create space like that, thinking about the food we put in our bodies, the information we allow in, the, the expression that we allow, you live a beautiful content life and i think being aware of the space that we work in being aware of the spaces that we create is really powerful so if you're thinking about oh, i'm i'm a writer and i can't write well look at the the space you design like the the, the time that you create for yourself the the ambience of the the space that you work in mm. the, the the literature that you allow the the process for your writing like all of that is is beautiful space and i think we often say we don't have time or money to do these things. Well, I would say that we're getting a bunch of time right now. And so finding space is, is a, a real necessity. 100%. I, I've, I've recently been challenging people um, to, to meditate because a lot of the time, as you know, the, the excuse is that uh, we don't have time to, to do so. It's one of the key ones. Oh, I'd love to, but I don't have the time. Got all of the time in the world now. Uh, better sit down and uh, look inward, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect opportunity. But yeah, awesome. Anything else to add, guys, Sean? Um, one, one other thing is um, just in terms of learning, right, which I find interesting is, and which I've been... Um, really mindful myself lately is uh, learning to enjoy and be proud of the pursuit in what you're trying to learn and becoming someone who is dedicated and willing to put in the effort to do that and being proud of that in itself, regardless of the result. Right. Oh, like something yeah. that's changed for me massively is so Les, you've known me for like well over a decade and up yeah. until very recently for me, it's always been, you know, what's the result? What do I need to do to get the result? Once I get there, I'll be happy. I, I've been like that pretty much my whole life up until very recently. Whereas now, um, you know, and I have to credit Tom Billy for that. It's um, learned the concept from him, which is, you know, becoming someone who is uh, proud of being someone who improves. 
and like that being your identity. Like I'm someone who does my best to improve and I don't hang my hat so much on the results anymore. So much as like me being that person who's willing to do that work. And then when I do things and I, and I, and I try new things and, you know, I try to become better at them. Um, I'm happy with the effort that I'm putting in regardless of if, you know, like I've just in this time we have now, I've decided I want to make pasta. I want to get really good at it. And the first couple of batches I've made are pretty average. Right. <laughs> but I'm like, shit, I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to put myself out there to, you know, um, be crap at something and then just keep going at it and going at it. And, and I'm happy with that in myself that I'm now someone who's willing to go through that process and I will be resilient and I will develop the grit, not just for passer, but for anything. So it's yeah. uh, embracing the suck because this it's passive yeah. with the suck. Yeah, but I, I love the, the Chinese proverb, proverb that says the journey is the reward. And I yeah. think if you can find contentment and peace and love and joy in the practice, then what ends up happening is <clears throat> it becomes more, it becomes effortless and you become in harmony with the moment. So instead of striving to get to this certain thing and then when I get there, I'll be happy. It's well, along this path, I can be happy at each step that I take and understand mm. that this is my first batch of past. And while it may not have been <laughs> what I expected, it is still damn good and I'm still proud and I've learned. And so I've got short feedback loops. And yeah. I think the gift is in the journey and, yeah. and being able to, to live and breathe in that, knowing that you have that, that you'll get better. I'm a person, that mindset shift. Uh, I'm a person who does enjoy the improvement. Then the improvement just just going to flow. And it's going to, you're going to get to the end point and go, I'm still as happy as I was when I made that first batch of pasta. And now it just tastes better. Totally. Yeah. And then um, what you, you mentioned a few times, and it's a short feedback loop. I think that part's really important. Um, yeah. Now that you've said it, and I think about it, um, having those short feedback loops, is really important and it encourages you along the way whether you do that yourself or someone else um, provides that feedback right like i think about it in terms of if, if i was going to run a marathon right i'm not going to be able to run the plenty of kilometers first go but if i had a coach just thinking about this right if i had a coach and they were like look you need to run this much for the first couple of days it might be one kilometer or even it might be 400 meters if you haven't run before and you do that and they're like, that's great. You ran 400 meters. Whenever anyone starts out, that is the best you could hope for. And you're like, oh shit, cool. Yeah. Like I did good today. And then the next day it might be a kilometer. And then the next week it might be two kilometers. But they're like, yep, that's what you meant to do. Right. And that's, that's a good result. Or maybe you need to shift it here and there as opposed to, oh, uh, I can't run 26 kilometers or whatever it is in the first go. And then it's like, I'm shit. I'm not a marathon runner. And that's, that applies to business too, because agile is all about that. It's like, you know, MVP and getting it to, to be viable and out there and, and get as much learning as possible. So shorten those loops, loop, 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 mm -hmm. because the learning and the feedback is, is the goal. Like, how am I doing? Oh, okay, cool. <clears throat> Did that. Yeah. I need to adjust this, need to adjust that. And if the loop is too long, which is one of the, the challenges with say uh, and with NAPLAN, which is the kind of education testing is kids do it in, in yeah, say April and then they don't get the result or May, I think it is. And then they don't get the results till September. Well, that loop yeah. is been and gone. So it's got no value, but if you did it and then got instant feedback, you're like, okay, cool. Adjust, adjust, adjust. And I think designing experiences where those loops are deliberate and short. So mm -hmm. coaching creates it, groups can yeah. create it. Um, practices like um, like tempo or speed or certain things like distance where you can quantify here's my loop here's my time things like that that's a quantitative one but then qualitative is how did I feel after that run like you know yesterday it sucked and I was out of breath today I ran did it felt really good and strong okay cool note to self and then capture that feedback so that's the, the key element it's not black and white there's just so much color in how you're doing it and going through it and looking for that feedback and really shortening them as much as possible so that they can allow you to course correct. Looking at your learning, yeah. like instead of just having a map and I get here, I have a map and a compass. 
Mm. This yeah. compass helps keeps me on track and, and I can adjust a degree at a time, but I'll get to my destination using both of these things. Totally. Awesome. Do you guys have anything else to I do now, I think. Short feedback loops. It's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think in a nutshell, I mean, uh, like you started off with Steve, education, a lifelong thing, right? And um, that, that in itself is a commitment and discipline and uh, self accountability to seeing the world that way, seeing life that way and moving through life with that view. And it's, and it's very similar to how we view it as a journey rather than a destination. Right. Yeah, um, and absolutely. How, how the Zen philosophy there basically, it is so simple, but it is complex as fuck at the same time in that it's just about stout self discipline and lifelong education and commitment to that and that only you know and once you sit there and really think through what that actually means in every single moment of your life it's actually the most beautiful thing that could ever happen you know that is that that is you know the essence of of living a content and colorful life full of depth and wonder and it is so simple. And as you said, it's hard as fuck. Hard because as fuck. <laughs> it's, it is so simple and so hard mm. in the same breath. He's like, yeah, oh yeah, duh. But the practice and that kind of, you know, the, the, what's it in yoga, abhyasa, like, you know, just showing up to your mat, the, the ded- dedication and devotion to the practice, that's mastery. Yeah. And those that seeing what we do as a craft and I'm becoming a craftsman, I'm becoming a craftswoman like that. That's a, that's a philosophical shift because instead of getting to the result and the result is the product, it's I'm getting better at allowing this to move through me and being flowing with it. And I think that's the real gift. It's, it's hard as hell, but it, if you can come to that realization, then learning becomes this thing that's that gifts you every day because you get to wake up again and start it all over again. hundred percent. hundred percent. Right. Oh, that was a beautiful discussion right. guys. Really, really enjoyed yeah. that. Uh, thanks for joining us for our first uh, guest interview, Steve. That was awesome. Really, really honored to have you on mate. Um, how about you? My tell, absolute pleasure. Tell, tell, tell everyone where they can find you, mate. Um, oh God, this is where you kind of throw up all your, your social media. And this is uh, uh, the best place is thrivecapacity.com. Mm. And, or if you want to jump out and email me, just steve at thrivecapacity.com is the cleanest and easiest way. Awesome. Um, and Shauna? Best place to find me is on my Instagram, Sean underscore Coop, S-H-A-U-N underscore C-O-O-P. Anything you want to chat about, just throw me a message. Anything you want us to discuss on the podcast as well, feel free to get in touch with me there. Yeah. And I'm just on findingspace.co. Uh, you can get on, in touch with me there. Send me an email. Um, same same uh, handle for all my socials as well, so you can get me there. Um, and we've, we've now got an email address. So you can hit us up on the hustle and flow podcast at gmail.com. If you have any uh, questions or suggestions for uh, topics in the future, or if you want to be a guest or anything like that. So, so yeah, hit us up on any of those channels. Cool. And as we always say, guys, if there's anything you got value from, I'm sure there is today. I got a lot of value out today. I've got like a whole list of notes that I took here from you, Steve. (laughs) Um, So, um, you know, share it with someone that might benefit. Um, that's how we grow the podcast and we have these discussions um, to learn ourselves and also hopefully to put things out that other people can learn from. And um, I think this is a great way to educate yourself, which is listening to people and, and the conversations. I think it's really cool. So if you did find value in this, would love if you shared it with someone. That's how we grow and we're available on all platforms now. Um, just subscribe, leave us a review. We'd love that. And uh, until next time, guys, thanks for your time. See you guys. Thanks, Steve-O. Ciao, guys. Thank you. It was awesome.